Dr. Craig Orr, our guest, he's the executive director of the Watershed Watch Salmon Society. He's speaking to the Cohen Commission, and the Cohen Commission is costing us so far what? About 14 million. They need another 11 million to get it sorted out. Uh, somewhere in that order, those numbers boggle my mind. <coughs> Mine too. But I think it's so important. I think it's important that we figure <coughs> this out. Absolutely. This is the first federal inquiry we should point out that we've ever had mm -hmm. on Sockeye. We have several reviews. In fact, uh, the Cohen uh, Commissioner actually reviewed something like 25 previous reports that DFO has done on fisheries management and sockeye to, br to come up with broad themes on what he'd like to investigate. So we've had reviews. They've had some, they made some changes, for instance, uh, in, in the levels of enforcement in the Fraser River, uh, more, more science on thermal impacts. But this is the first one that has uh, the ability to compel witnesses and also to uh, you know, mm -hmm. produce penalties for people who uh, perhaps perjure themselves. Okay. So, uh, take me to the Columbia River, uh, across the border, down Washington, right? Uh, what's happening with those runs? Well, maybe I don't, I don't know a lot about the Columbia, but I, I, will, I will tell you <clears throat> in, in, in the U.S., but I will tell you that the Okanagan River, uh, where the fish come up through the Columbia, uh, the sockeye are doing quite well. The Okanagan Fisheries uh, Commission, uh, uh, Howie Wright is uh, one of their fisheries uh, biologists there, They've brought, brought back all kinds mm. of sake to the point where they have a small mm. commercial fishery now, and they were on the brink, and they're coming back through dams and things like that. So why are those fish doing so well? One of the, one of the things that people suspect is that they're, they're, they're feeding somewhere else. They may not be going by salmon farms, uh, you know, better ocean conditions. So there's still lots of mysteries, but uh, those sockeye are, are doing quite well compared to many in the Fraser right now. Now tell me about the uh, fish farms along this coast. Are they Atlantic salmon, Pacific salmon, a little bit of both? How does it work? We used to farm mainly native Chinook and Coho salmon. Mm -hmm. the, start of the industry started on the Seashell Peninsula. Uh, but uh, since they were farming Atlantics and the rest of the world, and it's better to market Atlantics, and they're more docile. They're the cows of the salmon world. So right. they're, they're docile. They, that transform into better growth. So we've changed our farms. We probably have somewhere around 80 active farms in, in British Columbia. And most of those, 95%, are, are growing Atlantic salmon right now. See, it always makes me <coughs> nervous when we fool with Mother Nature. <laughs> Atlantic salmon cannot take a, a plane to get here. Exotic species. And, uh, mm -hmm. and we have found escaped Atlantic salmon in 80 rivers in British Columbia. We found some evidence that they're reproducing naturally in some. And there's been some science done showing that they can outcompete juvenile steelhead, native juvenile steelhead mm. in those rivers as well. Uh, steelhead <coughs> fish farms? Uh, is there, there such a thing? There is some rainbow and marketed steelhead in, mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a few small operations, yes, but not okay. in BC. So which of all the salmon, the chum, the, the coho, are best at adapting to thermal uh, waters, uh, warmer waters, or do we know? Uh, temperature tolerances vary uh, among the species, and I'm certainly not an expert on that, but as I think I mentioned earlier, the Chilco sockeye, or the super sockeye mm -hmm. of the Fraser, and they have a much higher temperature tolerance. But, uh, you know, in certain years, uh, we've been losing many hundreds of thousands of, of Fraser sockeye to, uh, you know, the impacts of stress uh, related to disease and temperature. Impacts. Right. And how do the sockeye know whether they should come home tomorrow or in a week? <laughs> Uh, their clocks have been uh, honed uh, through thousands of years of, of evolution, mm. for sure. And but they're changing those patterns, right? They're coming into the rivers earlier now, and many of the runs are coming in earlier, and we've seen mm. it since 96. And uh, again, uh, the, this has contributed. Uh, we've seen a lot of, of en route, increased en route and pre-spawn mortality in sockeye. So that's why we've seen this steady decline in productivity of Fraser River sockeye, although we're still looking for the underlying causes to that right now. What about other things? Sewage treatment plants, uh, <coughs> warmer rivers, climate sewage, change. Sewage was looked at in the Cohen inquiry, um, and uh, Metro Vancouver uh, had to admit that it, uh, it it had a ways to go to clean up some of the sewage, and that's a bit of a concern. Uh, we don't know the full impacts of sewage, but uh, we do know some research in in, in Europe uh, done by a scientist named Bing Finstad, where he saw that. Uh, uh, Atlantic salmon swimming through polluted rivers were much more susceptible to sea lice. Mm. So there's synergistic effects of pollution sure. that increases stress on fish, and uh, we don't know if any of that's operating here on this coast. Well, as you know so well, when humans are older, we're more uh, subject to disease. We just are because our immune systems aren't as strong. I'm sure the same happens with the salmon. Absolutely. Any small disease can get you mm -hmm. when you're coming back. So uh, you're testifying this week again 
testifying on water issues and uh, what we're, we're hoping, uh, you know, water is such a critical component of, of salmon habitat, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's warming up. The Fraser has warmed up maybe a degree and a half in the last 15 or 20 years, which is quite substantial. Uh, it causes a lot more stress on returning fish. And uh, one of the big issues I hope that does come up tomorrow in, in, in Cohen is the fact that there's a, the province manages water, right? So this right. is a federal inquiry, but the province plays a role in maintaining salmon habitat. But we have the most archaic laws in terms of protecting water in North America. Sure, run of river and all of that. Yeah, we have no protection for groundwater. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you, know, you may need a license if you extract more than 75 liters per second, which is a huge amount. But otherwise, you can go dig groundwater wherever you want. Our surface water licenses are oversubscribed. There's 40,000 of them out there. And uh, you know, water, and groundwater in particular, is very important to the resilience of salmon. It helps maintain stream flows and, and lower temperatures in the summer, and it keeps eggs from freezing in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. Right now, if you want as much, you, know, you can take as much groundwater as you want, uh, wherever you want. Well, there's so much we don't know. What do you think will change? How long will this go on, or do we know? We're, we've been told there's going to be a report uh, you know, this coming spring. Mm -hmm. and uh, it will have recommendations in it. Right now there are recommendations being put forward to, uh, to Justice Cohen from the various groups. There's something like 20 groups who have standing at the Cohen Inquiry. We're part of the Conservation Coalition. Uh, you know, there's, there's fishermen, commercial fishermen, there's several First Nations groups represented there. Uh, and there's Rio Tinto, they'll be there tomorrow. Right. Uh, so we're hoping to see some really uh, robust recommendations and, and we'll be making some, like for instance, separate out the promotion of aquaculture and the protection of wild fish from DFO. Put them in different places. Let DFO protect wild fish. Maybe put promotion of aquaculture in Industry Canada or something. Mm -hmm. We need to go back to a robust science program for DFO. We had what once was called the Fisheries Research Board of Canada. It was respected all around the world for its independence and its integrity. That all started going south with command and completion mm -hmm. where a lot of dissident scientists uh, actually quit DFO because they didn't agree with the recommendations yes, I of the remember. minister at the day. So, mm -hmm. you know, we can fix some of these things. There are many, many, many good people within fisheries and oceans who want to do the right thing, but they're not allowed at this time. Sure. And when a scientist says, I think there's a mysterious pathogen somewhere doing something, we need to find out what that is. We would do it for humans. Absolutely. And, you know, it was kind of intriguing to see Christy Miller, the, you know, the head geneticist, researching this at the Cohen Inquiry, surrounded by two big burly guards, uh, you know, and who wouldn't let anyone approach her or wouldn't let the media ask her any questions. So where's the transparency in what's mm -hmm. going on within, within our government as well? Well, more to come. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Dr. Craig Orr, Executive Director of the Watershed Watch Salmon Society.